Hi there. Welcome to the Lean Into Art Cast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, uh, engage with visual storytelling topics, making stuff. How do you make stuff? What's your process of making stuff? Uh, what kind of stuff do you want to make? What's the intention behind the stuff that you want to make? And how do you frame your life around the stuff that you want to make? Or does the stuff you want to make frame your life? Uh, we think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist. The other host is... Hey, I am Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience and game designer. How goes, Jersey? Uh, it's going okay. Uh, I I hope you w won't be too uh, uncomfortable if I say happy birthday to you on the air. I would not be too uncomfortable. Um, my youngest has um, uh, in her in her preschool. She let everyone know today that it was my birthday, and birthdays are such high currency at that age. <laughs> that I was at a after their school Halloween party that where many kids walked up to me and said, happy birthday. And that was pretty awkward because I'm like, my birthday's not that important. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> it happened a bunch of times too. I was like, oh, wow. So oh, that's great. Here we are. <laughs> What what greater honor could be bestowed upon you than that, right? So sweet, honestly. I mean, they it was nothing but good news and super kind. And, and I was like, I, how did <laughs> I kind of get how it happened when I think about it? But when you're there, it's it's a little it's it's uh you know a little bit of uh you know befuddling. I think oh, I'm so teaching sweet. on my birthday coming up. I will have to tell my students it's my birthday to see what kind of <laughs> result I get. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it it's it, who knows. I I would love to hear how that goes. All right. Oh, but so two topics. Two. We we said at the top that we you know pick a a topic every week. Uh, I feel like we have a. Is it immodest to say that I feel proud of the track record we've kept over the last however many years? Every week coming up with a new one? Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, we we typically pick some kind of intentional thing to delve to delve into. And even when it comes to doing extra lean, which is that's that's the podcast that we do um as a supplement to this one. And that's uh now only on our Patreon feed and only for our patrons, actually. But um, the the whole idea of extra lean is is to just sort of hit record and whatever's on our on our mind, we go for it. And um, even then, we end up typically coming up with something to dig into. Yet, it's not like the normal weeks. The normal weeks, there's like typically, you know, some some thought over a few days chipped away at at an outline of notes, thinking, yeah, here's here's a few important questions to dig into a thing. But you know a couple of times this being one of them we actually don't have that well and so instead we decided to make that the show right it's uh -huh. like what, what do you do about that like what do you do when you come up short on some things because uh and this is me attempting to frame things up um <laughs> is i noticed that on weeks where i feel pulled in multiple directions and i don't i don't mean to 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 suggest that that's like necessarily a negative thing. It's just, it's the nature of, um, I think it, more and more of us in, in visual storytelling wind up doing a lot of different kinds of things, right? Especially if you run your own business, you're gonna wear a lot of hats as they say in quotes. Um, invariably, you're gonna find yourself at some point stretched in multiple directions. And when that happens, at least for me, things fall off of the week, right? I had all these wonderful, marvelous plates stacked up on Monday. And every one of them was gonna be washed and cleaned by the end of Friday, you know, mm -hmm. but like, uh oh, here I am and it's Thursday. And like, there's so all, there's like five plates on the ground. They're all smashed to pieces. Um, what do you do about that? Right. Um, mm -hmm. I was just interviewed by a, a young man in, going to the University of Michigan for a, a school project. And he asked about, you know, uh, time management stuff because he, he had heard me talk about it on Lean and Tarcast, things like the Emergent Task Planner. And I said, you know, like there's, there are a few things more difficult than being involved in a, a very personal creative project that you have a lot of investment in and uh, you don't know um, 
whether you're throwing good effort after bad. If there's a lot of ambiguity in it and you don't know what, whether all this effort is amounting to anything and having some kind of evidence to show that you're getting somewhere um, is, is kind of a vital part of that process to get through big projects, right? So rounding back, what do you do when you look down? There's plates all over the floor. Did I frame it? <laughs> I think it, that's an awesome place to start because here we are trying to um, think about, I mean, this is, this is nothing that new for us to dig into, but like, this is the other angle. Um, you can, you can sit there at this threshold of, wow, there's a, there's, there's something going on that is, that, that didn't, didn't go the way I planned. And I had some, I had enough things planned where all of a sudden now they've affected each other, right? Where these, there was these interdependencies that sometimes we've framed as like, well, it's a great opportunity because you know, Hey, you're, you're a, uh, um, you're a visual storyteller in this age of, um, sort of flattened chains that, that used to have, well, okay, you would, you would enter through a system of a, of a hierarchy and then, and, and work your way up in an industry and that exists, but we have this other parallel thing. And, but Hey, if you're going this parallel path, you've got, uh, you know, now you're your own marketer and you're providing an evidence of an audience to where you're going. You, now you're your own um, sort of office manager, making sure that all these logistics and things are being met, you know, our supplies coming in and are you doing the assembly and are you the, you know, are you where, so you could stack all these hats. And a lot of times when we talk about the stack of hats, we're like, Hey, it's a stack of hats. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> this, look at this stack of hats that we get to, um, uh, explore and, and see instead of, and see the bigger picture of, of like what we do to engage in trade, um, instead of being only in one part, but then all of a sudden the, the, the stack of hats maybe, um, looks a lot different if it's all, it's a, an avalanche of hats, you know, falling down upon you. <laughs> that old game. Don't tip the waiter. Oh, everything fell off. I think about that a lot. That goes into my head every time I have one of these weeks. So, all right. Well, uh, then how about we dive into it, Rob? What do you say? Yeah, let's let's do that. All right. Well, let's play some music. Transition us over. And here's some music from one of those days that start with the best of intentions. <laughs> ah, a fresh day. Yep. Yeah, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Um, so... Mm -hmm. What are, what, what, what are we juggling right now? Like this is the on the ground part. So this is what, like what it looks like to be pulled in multiple directions. And maybe we can pick at that a little bit before we get into some of the, like the more abstract sort of coping strategies, uh, thinking about endurance and triage. Um, mm -hmm. But to frame it up, like what specifically are, are, are we juggling? Do you want to start Rob? Uh, certainly. Um... I think one of the, the biggest things I juggle is my own expectations of my capacity where, um, it's, there's something, there's something in a, a lot of us who are in this community. Okay. You, you're, you're listening to lean into art. I would be willing to bet you, you, you're dealing with this too, where you've got not just one commitment. Like there's, there's the, there's the thing you do to, um, essentially, you know, provide the funding to, you know, have your lifestyle and support whatever, whoever you're, you know, you're supporting and all that. But then there may be yet another thing. And the yet another thing is like, well, that's, there's this, there's these, my, my, your talents and your desire and all this kind of, you know, the inspiration and the, and the stuff that, that, um, somehow gets you over the idea that, well, that's even more work <laughs> that in order to make that, that succeed and be something of use and meet your expectations, that's a big extra thing. Um, if you choose to look at these things as, as separate. So I've been trying to, I've been, I've been exploring for a while looking at, um, my, my variety of, of my side projects and my main gig is sort of like, it's my suite of professional commitments. So, it's been interesting. I can't say it's, it's somehow calmed me down in all situations, but, um, the Stenzinger creative suite. 
but yeah, I mean, I know that I have a primary gig and, uh, of course, you know, my opinions, my opinions are on my own and whatnot. I, um, you know, have a, um, corporate day job that I do. And, uh, so I'm, of course I'm juggling that, but then, you know, a few different side projects, the other, the other commitments. Now there's some that are in flight and in progress though. They're, they're ongoing. Um, lean into art, right? Art and science punks. But then I've got some in development, the things that are, um, and of course I could mention ongoing. Occasionally I, I do need to touch the projects of uh, This Panda Needs You and Guitar Fretter. But thankfully those two projects are of a nature where they can have, um, they can be set into the world after a bunch of effort and then then I don't have to touch them for a while. So then there's these other things in development. So I've got a few game experiments I'm looking at, trying to be smart about things I've already developed and think, how else could I use these engines to accomplish new projects? So um, that plus this, uh, this, this bigger project, I've mentioned it here and there. It's two pizza team. Um, there's uh, uh, lots to do with that one. That, one's, that one is a game and a story. And I've been, um, you know, working on a variety of aspects of that, carving out time to, you know, work on like a, what kind of game engine would I, would I use sort of do that whole, um, feasibility, viability, um, desirability sort, sort of process that we've talked about anyway. Um, that's in progress also. And I mean, and in total, those plus others, I have about 13 hypotheses that I want to test that are all side project things. And each one of these things represents some belief I have that would be of service or, you know, in entertaining or useful, educational, what have you. And, um, that, uh, and, and in some way be a, uh, give some signal of viability as well, where I don't know, some of them, that's why they're hypotheses. I, I need to, I need to explore and test them, but I only have so much capacity to test these hypotheses. So I've had to uh, just pick a couple and that's where I'm starting. I don't know. That's, that's for, that's a sample of what I'm, what I'm juggling. Is that what you were looking to? Yeah, that is, that unpack? is what I, and then I want to yeah. jump at some of what you're talking about there because you def you broke it into in development and ongoing. How does the nature of each one change when the um, capacity gets, you know, when you, when you overestimate your capacity. Well, um, so ongoing implies a recurring schedule. So the recurring schedule um, in the prior, my, and how I choose to prioritize it, it takes precedence over things that are in, de in development. If I find myself at a certain point in the week and I have, um, I've got some, some time to work on a project and I look at, well, gosh, I really want to do a little more research into this, this animation tool I've been, I've been chipping away at, but typically it gets my treadmill time or stair climber time or whatever, um, where I watch YouTube videos learning about a uh, creature. And um, I was, I'm like, oh, I really want to try something with creature, but here I am. It's, this would actually be better time, better spent serving, um, you know, doing some, some topic development, development for lean into art or art and science punks. So that's an example. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question because it, 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 it's mixed, you know, because. Yeah. Well, I just think that that's, that's an important thing to define is that I think there's part of the ebb and flow of this. Um, this isn't like a constant pressure where it's like, you're constantly breaking boards. You're constantly showing up and like screaming and, you know, crouching down and lightning and fl fire is coming out from behind you no. every day because there's an ebb and flow in that some of this pressure is caused by scheduled recurring things but then there's other like um there's a modularity to it like an, an in-development project can get moved around on the calendar right mm -hmm. sometimes unhappily but that that's both an advantage and a shortcoming of it right yeah I uh, totally true. And that is one thing I'm really trying to work on is to just not, um, to, 
to find the um, more capacity in my patients and desire for a sustainable, healthy lifestyle, right? And practice this where um, if I chip away at one of those uh, projects in development and find that over, you know, a few weeks, if I'm, if I do invest the time to look back, I see, I have actually moved forward, right? It may not be the volume of moving that I desire, but, um, that's kind of where that project is. And, and, uh, the more accepting I am of that, um, I guess the, the less frazzled I feel. What about other professional commitments? Hmm. Well, I mean, the day job is quite important. Um, but then there's, there's also, uh, things that, um, uh, so sometimes depending on the audience, I, I can do, um, um, do pro bono talks or whatever, but I, I do talks to, and get paid to do them to help, um, you know, advocate and teach in the, in the space of, uh, user experience and, um, collaborating in flexible ways, testing, learning, doing, you know, minimum viable product type stuff and minimum lovable product. I, I do that, uh, upon occasion. And I love that. I mean, it's, it's, um, I appreciate that there's, you know, there's audiences that value that and I'm able to help, you know, deliver that product. But yet, um, this year I decided, you know, for all of it, like the, the paid talks, the unpaid talks, all that, I, I, I paused it for this year which is always nerve wracking, right? When you're like, yeah, I have a side thing and, and it's working. And then, you know, maybe it won't work when I come back to it. Maybe, maybe I will oh, not I get those that. gigs. <laughs> oh, God, do I feel that? <sighs> you get a good signal from something. You're like, I need to nurture that signal. And then like all of a sudden, Hey, here's like, you know, seven feet thick of commitment that just showed up, came a knocking time to pay the price oh i better attend to this well <laughs> please still be there when i come back <laughs> and and it may or may not be yeah. right uh it's a good sign it's a wonderful signal that it was there at some point yeah. so it's got it because some of this stuff some uh, some opportunities you can really obviously affect the odds i think as far as would they come up again and also when they come up, will you be able to land them? And, uh, and then if you land them, how well will you deliver so that they can come up again? Right. Um, I think you can affect a lot of that, but there's, I mean, part of, part of business is timing and like you can have, you know, a great service or idea or capacity or talent. And then, then, um, at one time it can be easy to reach an audience and other times it can be a lot harder. I mean, and it's just in what changed, well, the sort of, mm, uh, what was it? Oh, what it's not meta. It's uh macro macro patterns, right? Not to just throw your, you know, shrug your shoulders at it or, and, or just that I do that and walk away. Um, but it's, I don't know. It's something I try to remind myself as far as, uh, uh, timing matters anyway. And, and yet I, I with that lack of satisfying insight, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, um, <sighs> you know, you, you gotta, you gotta prioritize, right? And, and you have to prioritize. And I mean, the, the thing that I have learned with, with some pain is that you don't do yourself any favors by trying to chase that, that signal with diminished capacity, right? That signal kind of requires you to have some level of full attention in order to properly execute on it. And I've, and I've made, I've gone down rabbit holes thinking like, okay, this is a signal I need to pursue it because I have to like pursue every opportunity. And then I do kind of a bad job of it. And then I come back on like, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't really do that one well, right? And maybe that either it looked like less of an interesting opportunity because of my diminished capacity or I did such a poor job executing that it didn't become a, or it ceased to become an opportunity. Does that make sense? Uh, it totally does. Yet, 
um, I think there, there just can be a big variety of factors there. So yeah. maybe, maybe it's the execution. Maybe it's that, um, there's, uh, uh, let's see. Um, I mean, things change as far as there's a lot of variables, right? As far as a client's need, as far as, um, clients, uh, budget to meet the need, as far as, uh, clients, uh, attention and their priorities and, and, uh, Anyway, um, it's it's tough because you want to feel like you can control every bit of that, I think. And I, I you can control some of it, but it there it and that, you know, the things you can control as far as um doing doing your best at the given place and time when you've made the capacity to do that. Anyway, yeah, it's it's kind of hand wavy, but um what do you, what um what I, what I think is tangible is, is you, you can be, you can be left sitting there going, well, I don't know if I should put this down. And if I do put this down, um, you know, I'm scared it won't come back. <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's on the list there too. It sounds like I'm, it, I'm not alone right, as far as having that kind of stuff. Not at all. On the radar. Okay. So, um, what uh what kinds of things are you juggling jersey so um i i didn't i really like your framing up of like the difference between in, in development and ongoing things i would put in an extra category for me which is seasonal i have several Ooh. seasonal commitments um in that uh i'm doing my annual i'm in the middle of drawing my annual uh captain seriously in the super Ma super master sentinels comic which i've been posting about a little bit here and there on instagram um and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, talking about pressures, I've, I've been meaning to post something more length, lengthy about it on my Patreon, my personal Patreon. And just finding the capacity to do it, it's just, it's, it's not there. I can't score that two hours it would take to, like, put together something meaningful for it. Um, but what that is, is it's a 40-page it's a comic that I'm, I, I draw once a year uh, for the Seriously Coalition in Chelsea, Michigan. I write pencil, ink, letter, tone, the book. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's not, a, it's not a horrible deadline or horrible. It's not a intense deadline, but it's, it's, it's one with some friction, right? Like I've got, I got to do about a page a day, like for the next month, oh. um, which is totally doable. Um, but I'm also teaching four days a week, two classes a week in Chelsea, two classes a week in Ann Arbor. One of those classes involves, um, shipping a finished anthology. Like the kids are actually working towards like producing a 48 page book. So there's like an added pressure of uh, really keeping the kids motivated to produce and, and create something that's meaningful to them. And that matches the, the, the vision for the project as a grant funded project. So we got to also make sure that, you know, it's, we can't just do anything in this book, but at the same time, I don't want to tell kids you can't write about this. You know, <laughs> your, your, your inner inspiration is false. <laughs> That's not the kind of class I lead. But, <laughs> but the, like, the privilege of my other classes that I teach in Ann Arbor is that if things go off the rails with regard to my syllabus, it's not a problem. I can roll with it. And if we have a class where it's like the kids hijack it and we wind up you know, making some kind of nonsense comic by the end of the day, as long as they learn something and got a pleasurable experience out of it, everybody wins. But this one, it's like there's a goal. I have the mm. schedule that we got to meet. So like it adds an extra level of intensity to that. Um, and then, so th those are my seasonal things. Like these are like once a year, I go through this intense period of teaching and producing this comic. Um, and then ongoing lean into art, like you said. And then uh, in development is the Boulder and Fleet story that I want to produce after I'm done with this deadline. And if I don't have time to do a Patreon post, where am I finding time to do the development for this comic? I'm doing it like in little tiny chicken scratches, capturing here and there. Um, but uh, but hold on. So you have you categorized it as a in development project already? Yeah. So it's okay. Because I mean, for me, that category is actually pretty darn new. I mean, it's like you know maybe a month or two old. Oh, oh, because like when I, I have just like this shelf of projects and they're all equal in like my heart, then 
there's a lot of fighting <laughs> among them. Uh, where yeah. the once I had that, oh wait a minute, there's this other shelf. I mean, these really are the that's my research and development. That's this is this is what I'm going toward, and I inherently don't. I, and because of the new problems I'm solving in this space. I can't have the same expectations as the the ones that I'm all, I'm executing on in a very repeatable way. Mm. Well, okay, so maybe the, what I'm talking about is someplace in between those two things. Because yes, it's something that I have reproduced. It's something that I have executed on. I've proven that I can do it, and I've tested assumptions about it. This, but now I'm adding a whole new layer of assumptions to it, uh, or hypotheses, I should say. Okay, so it's more development than research and development, right? Right. Okay. It's further development based on past research and development. Okay. So there's some place in between there. there. There's ambiguity around in that I don't have my outline finished yet and my outline needs to exist before I can start thumbnailing. And there's a couple key questions that I want to answer before I sit down and do the outline. Or do I need to sit down and do the outline to answer the questions? That's the, the, the tension I'm kind of riding on that. I don't want to make this sound like it's more painful than it is. It's not that painful. It's more like just scoring the couple hours to sit down and do it. And once scoring the hours, forcing myself to do it because then there's that whole business of, all right, here's your, here's your couple hours. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, Yeah, that's another, that's another thing too. Um, the, the, the context switching and the, and the wearing the different hats. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean we we have visited this plenty. Yeah. It's it's not uh it doesn't come for free. I mean it's um I and what's funny is I I find I have I have some capacities that go away <laughs> and and or are diminished where uh depending on like for instance one of them that's that that always comes up for me is if I'm doing human centered research and design and you know, visual thinking and testing hypotheses related to interactivity and flow and all this kind of stuff and, and goals and tasks. That's like a different part of my thinking than when I'm, um, when I'm, when I'm coding and I'm solving, you know, especially that like, yes, writing is, is also different, but like not as severe of a switch when, um, when I'm solving, um, what are to me complex, you know, technical challenges then, and if I'm immersed in that and then switching between the two, that really can, I, I can spin my wheels. Let's you know? talk about that in the second half. I want, okay. I really want to dig at that. I want to dog ear that because like the switching of modes, I think is also a trickier part of this whole puzzle. Um, and especially all my friends who, who are parents, I watch them do that switching, I think a little bit more fluently than, than what I think I'm capable of sometimes because I see them having to navigate that in their lives so often with kids. Um, but yes, yeah. the, the, the problems I'm solving in a classroom are very immediate. There's like, there's a certain, there's a certain lack of, of control that is much more apparent to me in that moment than when I'm actually writing versus when I'm drawing, right? Those are three different, totally different mindsets, you know, mm -hmm. like I finished thumbnailing recently and when I, uh, sat down to start drawing the comic there was like this immense just release it was like oh i'm just drawing now i don't have to be thinking so hard i can let my mind wander a bit you know whereas i don't have that luxury when i'm teaching or writing um, i think that adds to that sense of juggling too is if, if you have to do those mode switches a lot in a given day um, there's yeah i mean it's funny you can have backup capacities somewhere that help you switch mode switch modes and, uh, but depending, they may not be there, right? Yeah. Where it's like, um, oh, you know what? I, uh, at a certain time in my life, I would actually play, um, I don't know, I would play like a violent video game to switch gears, right? Um, violent for me, like Halo or something, right? And, uh, and, I, and that would be at like, you know, 6 p.m. We got off work, I'm gonna switch gears for a little bit. And now that's not really an option in my current, situation you know to two young kids and all that as far as how i choose to you know what i choose to expose them to and whatnot so anyway yeah capacities um, there's another there's another Back capacity up. layer on here that i want to dig at very briefly and that is not letting myself turn into an inhuman monster 
who only thinks of working all the time. Um, I had a discussion with somebody recently about, again, the Emergent Task Planner. They, they saw mine, and they saw how my work gets distributed throughout the day, and I can wind up working literally from 9 a.m. till after midnight, but it's not, the whole time isn't spent working, right? There's these huge chunks in between where I'm trying to be a person. And it's mm. like, no, here's three hours where I'm like being present for my wife and, you know, or this here's like an hour where I'm exercising or trying to do something that's self-care. Um, so something that I notice a plate that often falls on the ground is, is self-care. Like that's one that falls off very, very frequently when I get uh, stretched to my limits. And I've tried to have like a really hard talk with myself about it, saying like, don't let that happen. Something else needs to break. That shouldn't break. Um, so fit it in however you can. Mm. Um, and it's the same thing with trying to be a good husband, but also trying to be a good friend. Like I'm noticing that like in, in tough weeks or tough periods of time, I'm getting, I'm finding texts from friends that um, go unanswered for up to a week. Right. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You know, and like, you and I talk about this all the time. Like, it's like we try to stay in touch in between episodes. We don't always do it, right? We the, the intention is there. The intention is there, and it's very intense. We both <laughs> want to do it, but finding that is tough. And I and I take that as that friction as a signal that okay, I need to rethink how I'm organizing things in my life. And I, I'm right there with you. So is this? And and are we going to try to? to do some strategizing about this then and, and uh, <laughs> is that the signal and and no well, i mean you're you know you're talking about switching modes you're talking about the the more you know, the human cap capacity uh relationships and all that kind of stuff right so i mean that that's another um uh, at least a launching point into um going ten thousand feet up i think all right well that sounds like a good idea all right so we'll do that in about a minute and a half uh, so those of you who are listening on your podcatchers with a 30 second fast forward button, don't use it. Listen to this ad spot because it's actually going to be good. We're going to talk about some people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash lean into art is the address. And what will you find there? Well, what is it? It's a way for you to give a monthly upvote to us, a way for you to say, hey, I believe in you guys. I believe in the stuff that you make. I want it to be sustainable. Here's a dollar a month. I, I think you guys are doing a, a great job. Keep it up. And we want to thank five people who have been doing that. First off, Jesse Kaufman, at Jesse Kaufman on Twitter. Thank you for believing in us, Jesse. Uh, Kelly Ishikawa, at Kelly of Ishikawa on Twitter. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Marshall Lee. Uh, Marshall Lee is also known as Marshall Couture on Twitter. Thank you, Marshall, for supporting the show. And Esprit Devora. Find Esprit on Twitter, at We Are LA Tech. And finally, Catherine Sugru. You can find Catherine at Kat Sugru, S-O-O-G-R-O-O. -O -O. You should follow these people because they're fellow leaners like you. They enjoy the show and they support it. And what, why do they support it? Because there's every show we produce is posted there. And I'm scrolling through it right now on the website. But also our extra leans, the shows we record in between the shows, where episode 113 was reasons for taking a break from creative challenges. And like Rob said at the top of the episode, it's us just like sort of finding the topic and having a fun conversation. And it becomes an open mic post where you can uh, follow up with whatever points you want to make in a safe environment where only people who support the show hang out. And we thank everybody who has been supporting us uh, at patreon.com slash lean into art. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it means a lot to us. Thank you. 10,000 feet up time. Uh, mm -hmm. Here we go. I'll just do mm -hmm. a fast one. And there we go. Um, what do you want? To, what do you want to talk about? Which where okay. do you want to start? Strategizing. All right. um, okay, so th we're thinking about triage. We're thinking about um, the the endurance, and I think that that those are strong, um, strongly resonant with the, with the ideas of well, switching modes, prioritizing. How do you you know how do we adjust here? and also that the human side and, and you like we what did you say you didn't you didn't want to be like a robot or a an inhuman monster <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't want to yeah. turn into like a production machine you know i yeah. mean and i think my younger self glamorized that my younger self said like i love comics that's what i'm about and that's what i'm going to attend to mm -hmm. and if it ruins a relationship that's just a casualty of the battle i'm in you know um, so hardcore jersey <laughs> yeah i was an angry young man 
Uh, and now it's like, uh, you know what? Um, this is my only time around. And yes, I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave something that was useful to somebody. But uh, also I've seen like the kind of cascading effect uh, one can have through just interacting with people in a positive way. I'd like to do a little bit of that, a little bit more of that too. Um, let's attend to that as well. Hmm. This, um, this isn't exactly related, but just kind of going with the flow. It's, um, I recently read the read or experienced the audio book, um, the book of joy. And that was, that was an interesting, it was a recommendation from my wife, Kate, uh, who I do a podcast with called art and science punks. Um, Oh, wait a minute. Do you mean art and science punks at art science punks dot fireside dot FM? It's the one in the same, you know, it. A fabulous podcast everybody if you haven't subscribed subscribe and tell a friend to subscribe <laughs> well thank you it's and it's super kind it's uh it, it is a fun show it's you know really different than this and if you're you're looking for that um uh i guess just to to round off on it we we go into family things and and um we love to to dig into our the, the kind of crafts and things we make um the things that we're curious about that fall under the banner of art and science and a lot of times how we apply it to our family life and stuff What's the name of this this book that you audio book? But anyway, that's uh, the book is called uh, the Book of Joy, and I can't remember the third author's name, but it was um, by Bishop Desmond Tutu and uh, the Dalai Lama. Ah, the Book of Joy: Lasting Happiness in a Changing yeah. World. Let's pull that up real. So quick. you know, whole um, minefield of potential philosophical you know debate or concern. Uh, I come from this as a secular humanist. Um. And uh, I find much, much like you described, like how you were more severe in your youth. Um, I described myself as an atheist, right? And uh, nowadays I'm like, hey, you know, secular humanist. So anyway, so Book of Joy, you know, two, two, you know, philosophical and religious figures that are friends talking about um, almost honestly doing their own kind of podcast, <laughs> digging through um, big questions like, well, how how could you how could you find a way to um work through the pains of the world but have but but feel good about having a good life on your own right and and like this this is there's so much opportunity for cognitive dissonance and how do they deal with this and and um anyway one of the um what like what interesting theme in that book that resonates with i think the conundrum that we're describing is um ex the importance of compassion so and how compassion is different and maybe greater than empathy um so empathy is sort of like the these are two things that get screwed up a lot they get they get conflated or miss or, or flipped uh people think one is the other so yes making this definition i think is important well, and I'm taking a swing here, and I might, I may whiff on. Please, please, please back me up. So, right. okay. So I, so empathy is sort of that being able to see um, and identify with the feelings, recognizing the feelings, right, of of others, and that is a very useful thing. And whereas um, compassion is, uh, no, I, I, I'm not going to pull it off. It's, it's, it's like. I'm going to push myself to see if I can define it, but like, okay, it's, it's, let's see, it's not just that, that recognition, it's, um, it's connecting with and following through more acting on and can, and, and, re and, um, actively relating to how's that, yeah, that kind of, okay. And, and that's a, that's a pretty big difference, different distinction. So, um, it, it, it removes you from like a, being in a, a potentially passive role and to a more active role. Yeah. Hmm. So it's got to do with, with, with hanging out with people, hanging out with people. Okay. And also the, the triage and endurance. So, um, I think compassion is something that I, I work on as far as being compassionate with my, with myself and understanding that uh, um, I can have unrealistic expectations and I am practicing to hone those so that they're more reasonable yet also um, 
even when they're not just be like that's that's just a that's that's a quirky aspect of who i am and i don't need to walk away from that in a sad defeated severe way i'm gonna oh, can i can i do the devil's advocate thing i know it sometimes it can be quite annoying but I no <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't find it annoying. Oh, sometimes it can be, but bust a uh, note. I well, okay. Let me just say that in some circles, I've noticed that when I do this, people are like, "Ah, oh, come on." Uh, but but Rob, that's just you making excuses for yourself. You failed. You made mm -hmm. a plan. You tried to execute. You didn't. Stop coming up with all of these this this narrative expl explanation and excusing yourself from having to try harder and just show up to the to the you know the sure. the, the batting plate and try harder sure sure a hole so... <laughs> ah, this was worth it <laughs> six years of this it was worth it anyway um so, okay, so uh now i'm reminded of a different book um it's um, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown because, okay, different emotions function differently for diff different people. You can get things done. You can have a life. You don't have to do one thing one way or the other. There's nothing that I'm claiming is like, oh, this is absolute rightness, whatever. Because you can sort of flog yourself into compliance and progress if, you're, if that's your approach, right? Um, I think it has some risk of lack of sustainability, right? Because I think there would be less incentive to um, adapt and break patterns that aren't working. If you have a, um, a way of giving yourself feedback that is more based on shame and guilt. So I would, I would hypothesize, or I would offer that what you were presenting had, had a lot of judgment and implied like and and therefore like now you should you should just taste the shame and <laughs> taste the shame get, yeah get back up and 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 it through your awfulness make progress anyway because <sighs> you know maybe you get to feel better if you prove that you're not as terrible as maybe you are right now it's just ah yuck you know i've done this to myself i i don't i don't um yeah i try i try to notice if i if i'm doing it you know again uh, i've you know dealing with uh um projects that are overly ambitious and um really wanting to you know I just miss by through misprioritizing and ascribing it to being like, well, I'm a perfectionist and that's why I rebuilt that thing I coded for the 10th freaking time and why this game isn't done or whatever. Right. Specifically the game project Jinhanu, which I've mentioned on the show before. Um, I was really dealing with that. At, uh, so anyway, speaking from experience. Um, anyway, so what do you think? Well, I, I, I do actually agree with that having um, a sense of compassion towards oneself the way like uh, a conversation I had with Zach Gialongo a long time ago. I, I forget where this conversation happened. I believe it was on a podcast. Um, he said that we both agree that we're the kind of person who is mortified to show up late to something. But if somebody mm. else shows up 15 minutes late, it's no big deal. Right. If they show up late, it's like, oh, hey, it's no problem. I was just, I just had, I had a book, started reading, I had a sketchbook, started drawing. Uh, never hold a grudge. But if we show up, if either of us shows up 15 minutes late, it's like, oh my gosh, I, I'm history's greatest monster. <laughs> 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 and we thought, okay, that there's a problem there. There's a problem when you catch yourself doing that. Uh, clearly, I need to be a little bit more compassionate towards myself. I at least owe myself the compassion I, I give towards other people. Right. <sighs> Right there. That's it. And, and I think the, the book of joy makes a very strong case for compassion, both, you know, internally. And then, uh, as, a, um, an important aspect of connecting with, um, with the rest of the world and, um, somehow finding a way to, 
have a capacity of, well, if someone does something that is disharmonious, they cut you off in traffic, they um, somehow, mm, this is, it gets harder. Like you can, you can up the stakes, right? You can up the stakes all the way. What's really tough in that book is like, I don't care how far you up the stakes. They talk about people who have been through that and still find compassion. So it's not, it's a book with, if you want to, you know, get a little choked up and, and, uh, um, and, and philosophical, then, uh, it's a, it's a <laughs> definitely a good source for that. Um, because, you know, people just, you know, describing their stories of being separated from their families and, and, um, and, uh, uh, having to essentially, you know, leave their homeland and the, the, the incredible difficulties they faced. And anyway, um, this is, uh, it's, it's, it's really tough, but honestly, how useful is that to hear others experiences and compare them to your own, like in dealing with your side projects. Right. And, uh, and for me, I've, I found that like a nice foothold to say, yeah. There's a, there's a practical aspect to this as well. I've just been talking about this with my classrooms. My students had the, uh, I got that, that time honored question that every generation has to step forward and ask is like, what, but I don't know where to find ideas. And, uh, and, and, and I said, well, you get that from your life experiences by engaging with people and interacting with people. Those, those emotional, emotionally charged experiences, positive or negative are the fuel for your stories. And they said, yes, but <laughs> This very sweet young person said, but you're old. You've had lots of life experiences. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I haven't had it that many yet. And I'm like, that is a fair point. And I said, but, and I pulled out um, my latest Boulder and Fleet story, a friendly game. And I said, this is based on an experience I had in first grade. You know, this, this story was literally born out of something that I encountered by interacting with people in the first grade so you're in fifth grade now you got enough to at least do that you know so anyway but going out and being a human being is how you get more stuff to write about so that's a um david Gram is in the chat says this episode uh or the episode you guys did on self-care kind of goes right along with this episode um people who like up uh who like this one should check that one out too. That's uh, episode one seventy four, self care back from February. That was a while ago. Mm, uh, yes. Thank you, David. Um, I'm really happy that you were there to to point that out, so people can if 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 this hour isn't enough, go back to episode one seventy four because I do remember having this discussion with you, Rob. We've talked a lot about this. Yeah. Did we did we have that talk with Casey Van Heith? I, I seem um, to remember talking about self care, or did I? We did do hmm. one with Casey Van Heys a while ago about self care. I'll have to look up what I think episode it's come that up. Was. So yeah, there's there's a couple of them. Um, yeah, really good point. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, so okay, related to okay, compassion and um, looking at our um, our capacity to um, to do the triage and endure it. <laughs> is there is there another angle on this too? Like. Well, okay. What to pick up, what this, to put down? Well, maybe we can kick this puck back and forth a little bit because I mm -hmm. don't know how, how to handle it. Um, I once went to a job interview well, this was like 15, 17 years ago. Oh my gosh, it was like, it was like 16 years ago. Um, and it was for uh, one of those big auto companies that do like those auto auction shows, like those big fancy old car shows. And it was like to be a oh. graphic designer for like a catalogs of old fancy cars. And I remember that I sat down for the interview and they, this, this triumvirate of people sat around me and they did like this whole speed thing where they were talking about all these hypotheticals going like, okay, it's 4.59. You've got one minute to get out of the office. This salesman comes in, he needs this designed right away. And this salesman comes in, he's got this designed right away. What do you do, dude? What do you do? You know, like that was my, and I failed the interview because I was like, well, I look at the two jobs and I figure out which one, if they are of equal importance, I look at which two t would take, uh, of the two, which would take the least amount of time, I take on that one first. Mm -hmm. Apparently that was an unsatisfactory answer, but never mind, it doesn't matter. I'm here now. Um, <laughs> did they? Did one of them rub an envelope to their head and open it after you <laughs> answered? <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> Liberace in the bathing suit. I don't know. That just sounds kind of interesting interview style. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Anyway, totally yeah. doesn't matter. But but like I don't want to. 
my point is that I'm, I'm nervous about putting that into this discussion of like, okay, how do you prioritize when you got like the plates falling on the floor? How do you figure out which is the most important? Uh, sure. I don't know if I have like really clear thoughts on this. Hmm. Because I, 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 there's there's baked in priority when you have ongoing scheduled things. When I got to go to class, I got to go to class. Mm -hmm. I've agreed to be there. I'm being paid to be there. You know, that's non-negotiable. Um, the Lean Into Art cast is one of those non-negotiable things. Like it's something we do 10 o'clock every Thursday night, 10 o'clock my time, 9 o'clock your time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like that's something. I mean, there's like, there's some flexibility there, but it's one of those things where it's like, I just, I build my week around these like non-negotiable pieces of time. So that helps, right? And as a matter of fact, I thought about introducing that into more other aspects of my life where it's like, okay, I need to like block this period of time as like, this is a non-negotiable piece so that I'm always guaranteed to have that many hours to do this particular thing that I want to do every week. But, um, but on the other hand, there's a flexibility in my life that's really hard to give up where, because of the, the modularity of the kind of work that I do, um, things like a friend pinging me to say like, Hey, can I talk to you for 15 minutes about this thing that I'm working on? I really could use your pair of eyes on it. And it's like, Oh, well this goes back to my checklist of, I want to be a better friend. Sure. Here's that 15 minutes. Oh, did it turn to 30? Cause we we're also catching up. Well, it turned to 30. Well, now it's 30 minutes that got taken out of something else. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, yeah, I don't think there is a great answer for that other than, um, I mean, what you described is something you've arrived at through, um, through adjusting. It's not like that. Um, I, it sounds like, it, you know, you would, you would have had an approach at some time in the past that would have not necessarily said, well, I'm going to make the, I'm going to make the time to do this thing. Right. So if you have this severe commitment to every single bucket that has one, some benefit to it, but you know, one of the big trade-offs is, is flexibility. And when you have a little bit of flexibility, you have a greater capacity to greater capacity to connect and have compassion with people around you. And, and uh, this is one of the giant influences on, on like what I choose to work on and especially how with all my projects. And we've talked about this, you know, a few times in the past is um, you know, like being a, being a husband and a father and, and, and then also having a, um, a, a day job. That's not these other projects, which means that um, especially the, the being, a, being a, um, being a parent, the kind of um, lovely, wonderful, um, super challenging chaos that, um, you know, the whole spin up time, spin down time and stuff that I, that I would enjoy as like, these are thresholds between this is how I switch gears to work on my side projects or whatever. Um, I've needed to and wanted to adapt and change to be present. And, um, like one of the biggest things is, is, um, I needed to be able to be productive or, well, a strategy I chose was to not have to work at a desk where I think for other people, they would come up with a different conclusion. They'd be like, you know what? When I walk away from the desk, it all stays at the desk. That's super cool. For me, I was like, well, my desk is anywhere so I can get interrupted and, you know, find quiet places here and there and, and work it in, in an improvisational way. Um, and overall, you know, like I've, I've adjusted, like you described your approach and, um, but, uh, anyway, this, yeah, this it's, it's an, it's an interesting ongoing puzzle that, uh, uh, yeah, I'm still, I'm still chewing on like one of my biggest projects in recent weeks was of doing a fresh dig into this mm. to be like, all right, my expectations are a little bit too fired up on you know a few different projects five projects i need to lower the number and i need to look you know adjust the scope and and also be be really clear with like these projects are not the big money makers right now like they're they're not here to do these other jobs they can't occupy the same kind of priority they just can't so i found that I find it healthy to clean up, clean house in that way. 
Mm. Okay, let's go to some of your money making projects and managing okay. the, you know, um, what am I trying to say? The endurance and triage of, of those things when they get to be causing friction. Um, mm. With with projects that are higher priority, do you do any kind of um, management with regard to uh, tracking the time and looking at like timelines and when's your deliverable date or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of having a clear commitment. Yeah. With any kind of um, like anything, um, any kind of. I can't think of a prof professional transaction I've engaged in that hasn't had some kind of tangible timeline. And if, you know, even if it was a soft timeline that provided this, this heartbeat, this feedback loop of like, well, when we started talking and, and then, you know, landed some kind of contract or commitment, and this is whether it's been like at a day job or not, you tip typically will have something that you, uh, especially if it, if it's some kind of um, creative day job, you know, working in software, or whatever. I mean, I I think everyone gets projects, right? So when a project comes up, um, you got to have some clarity about that, about like what kind of at least you know rough rough a effort and expectations and timeline or whatever. So like, yeah, I mean that's a that's an important part. So yeah, so like um, that's 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 one of those uh, triage things that I sort of lean on is I keep spreadsheets of ongoing or rather like whenever I take on a new project and I'm under contract on it, I build a spreadsheet with a timeline on it. And that spreadsheet gives me the feedback of, let's say I have a rough week where it's like, oh, I'm early in the project. Maybe I missed a few days of production on it. Um, but, you know, I think I'm okay. I've got a clear number that I can refer to to say like, oh, this is where I'm at. And if I notice that the like I've got a, a spreadsheet that actually tracks like how many pages per day I need to produce in order to meet, mm. meet my deadline by this date. And um, if I see that number get too high, like if it's like, oh, you're at three pages a day now if you want to make your deadline. I'm like, oh, well, now I'm going to have to prioritize this over other things to burn more, burn through that uh, that workload more to bring that number back down. Does that make sense? No, um, totally. Yeah, it becomes a, a just like an easy thing for me to look at to, to help me prioritize the different things that I'm working on. Um, because otherwise, uh, I, I've had deadlines go where it's like, I'm like, oh, is it really only two weeks till the thing's due? Oh, crud. You know, I've got 20 pages to go. You know, that, kind of thing. that, I mean, that kind of feedback loop is fantastic. And, uh, and it's, it's nice. So you have the specific meter within there as well, as far as like pages per day. Um, that's a really nice mechanism. And that um, makes it easier to forgive myself too. Like, so if <laughs> I have a crummy week, I'm like, well... The meter only went up a couple points. You know, it went from 1.5 pages a day to 1.7 pages a day. Not the end of the world, right? Hmm. I can let myself, I don't want to say let myself off the hook, but I can, I can not feel like I need to put a hair shirt on and go into the woods <laughs> and flagellate myself for a while in order to like make up for um, the horrible, horrible deed of, of not attending to the thing all the time. Perhaps that's a future topic. I just wonder why those two things are combined where it's like things are going wrong, you know, fire up the feel bad machine. Right. Yeah. And it's like, I, I, it's so common, you know, and, and I'm right there with you. I, it's, um, things are, let's see. Okay. So having a benefit of, um, doing a lot of projects over time, chances are you've, you, I mean, you've built these mechanisms, right. And I've built mechanisms. So like for, for me, I, I know that, um, there are like different research tasks, you know, I'm going to need a few days, some, some I can do a couple things within a day and, and, or it depends on like the foundation I'm building from, right. Am I iterating on a particular um, mechanism or do I need to build a new one? Uh, do I need to, you know, build screens to test or not? This is all, um, I, I, so I look at the current commitment. What is it going to take? And then I know like, oh no, I've got like two commitments that are too complex for, for a short period of time. So, I mean, so do you get into the position where then do you renegotiate or yeah. do you, or do I, you sacrifice? Yes, I try or, to. Right. Yes. I mean, when it came to working on uh, my last couple books, I know that I renegotiated in terms of time. Like, can we have a little bit of extra time? 
here's where I am. This is how much is left. I think it's going to take this much time. Based on what I've done so far, this is how much time I believe it's going to take. Can I have that extra time? You know. So, but discovery and good communication um, with with trust, it's like that. That's a that's a process that has resilience, right? Yeah. I mean, because without it, like you can have. Um, let's see. And I, I say this not as someone who thinks, well, eh, don't try, right? Um, I mean, I believe in being holding yourself accountable, right? and you know, you you committed a thing to someone, um, and if you're tuned into how it's going, you can help tune someone else into how it's going. Oh, I think I think you're hitting on one of the things that makes it makes the feel bad machine fire up when you're when things are going bad, though, because a powerful motivator for me, I know I've said this elsewhere, is um, having to look an editor or a client in the eye and say, I need more time. Like that is such a painful experience for me. Why is that a painful experience? Well, probably because I have a lot of my own personal value wrapped up in this notion of being a professional delivering on time and delivering good material, right? Um, a lot of my self-worth comes out of achieving those things. So when I have to look somebody in the eye and say, you know what, these things that I hold, hold in high esteem for my own sense of self-worth, I didn't live up to that. Time for me to feel bad about it. And that's why it makes it really difficult for me to, to engage in that. And when I engage with it, I always feel better for it. I'm always like, okay, now we've got capacity again. We've got this thing is manageable. I'm not going to drown in it, and I'm not going to ship really crummy material in order to make a deadline. You know, this thing's going to be a good project as a result of this. And as a matter of fact, five years from now, probably nobody's going to remember that contract renegotiation. They're just going to remember that there's a good, there's this wonderful artifact of this thing that we made together, right? Um, that perspective is all there on the other side of that uncomfortable conversation. But first, I got to pass that threshold, Guardian, of here are the three things that you <laughs> deem <laughs> as your self-worth. Destroy each of them and pass this gate. <laughs> That's... uh. That's a that's a tough character, the threshold guardian. Yeah, he's but, he's, uh, he's he's an a hole too. <laughs> so what do we? All right, um, the threshold guardian, and then it's wonderfully ambiguous what we're describing because sometimes, um, I mean, sometimes my answer is to then negotiate in other directions, right? It's like I negotiate in my relationships and say, no, I can't make that thing. Yeah. And yeah. or Yeah. That's another right? one. I, mean, I cancel appointments with friends. Yeah. It's not fun. It's not fun, but like the it's somewhere as you're you're navigating that and coming up with your your tactical choices to adjust. Um I mean no one call is correct, right? I mean, sometimes you can find the capacity by negotiating, you know, on the personal side of things. And uh, I've been on a lot of projects. I've been on a lot of projects where, you know, most of summer I saw the inside of an office building, you know. And um, so I try to take that as a life lesson to try to not have myself or other people go through that again, right? Let's be really disciplined about what we're engaging on up front instead of you know being ignorant of these costs and um making commitments that we don't understand what we're committing to right mm -hmm. this has been a giant influence on what i've chosen to practice <laughs> uh, because the sun is nice people are awesome and uh it's great to see both so yeah uh, uh as I'm not trying to just wrap things up in the silly statements, but like, uh, what, um, all right. Yeah. It's, we, it's, I think it's, it's final thought it's time. time for... Um, but I'm not sure what it should be yet. I do want to take this moment to, uh, address, uh, something we mentioned earlier. You were mentioning Casey Van Heist episodes. I think this might be one of the ones where we talked a little bit about, uh, self care with Casey, which was episode 144, finding satisfaction with the work. Uh -huh. Um, I know we talk about self-care a lot with Casey. That comes up a lot in, in episodes with her. And I just let me just say to people, if you really, uh, I recommend any and all episodes that she's on. Um, so you can go to patreon.com slash lean into art and under the search bar, just search for um, LIA cast Casey Van Heis and all the episodes will pop up there. Or you can find them at leanintoart.com or your favorite podcatcher or on YouTube. 
but yes, uh, do search for those. You won't be sorry because Casey is awesome. Casey is awesome, which isn't necessarily our final thought. No, but, but it could be, but no, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with a final thought. Uh, All right. Sounds I'll, good. I'll, I'll wrap up for this. Let's trust ourselves, Rob. We can mm. do this. Uh, I believe in us. I do so, too. So let's, it, let's do, let's do uh, one more ad spot and then we'll figure out how to, how to close out this discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, so in about two minutes, we'll be talking to covering our final thought. No tease on it. Just watch, watch Rob and I flounder as we try to find some kind of <laughs> congealing and all thought. This. <laughs> a congealing thought. Mm. Let's, let's staunch the Delicious. flow of blood by forming a clot at the end of this episode, Rob. Uh, <laughs> it's a feast of metaphors. All right. That's let's uh, see how gross we could make it. All right. Um, before we do that, we got to thank some other people who make this show possible. Those people happen to be us. We make this show possible. Uh, and part of the way we make this show possible is through our experiences in making lots of different kinds of things. I happen to make a webcomic uh, called Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire at boulderandfleet.com. Um, the latest story, like I mentioned earlier, uh, is called a friendly game. And, uh, I've been posting some in development stuff over on the Boulder and fleet Patreon at patreon.com slash Jersey. But if you haven't read the comic yet, it's about two best friends who go on adventures. Uh, fleet, the bird happens to be a very ambitious young bird who wants to be the most famous and, uh, wealthy adventurer. So she, that she never wants again. Uh, unfortunately she's, uh, thrown in her lot with this big, peaceful bear who has immense strength but doesn't want to hurt anybody makes it kind of hard to go on adventures and stop dragons and monsters if your uh if your muscle is a gentle giant and so it's about them navigating these problems uh with one eye on keeping the peace and one eye on uh you know using using might and that's at boulderfleet.com uh, it's mm-hmm. also on I- instagram tapas.io twitter and so on rob you make a game uh let me pull up the game while you talk about the game Oh, that's super fun. Thank you. So if you are watching the video, you will be able to see Jersey play this panda needs you. And what this game's about, it's, it's about pattern matching, uh, stacking shapes in a, in a, in a simple physics game. It's a very mellow situation where, um, well, I mean, it depends on your relationship. Well, you know, you have this friendly panda who shows up, there's a stack of blocks, everything's fine. Right. Until a cloud comes, knocks them all down. And now your job is to help this panda put things right, put things back to the way they were. And this gets progressively harder and over, you know, 50 levels where uh, the panda keeps encountering new patterns of blocks and different shapes, different colors. And um, that's, that's the game. And, and it's like the panda starts to dance as you make progress. So it's, um, you know, you get to, you get to see the, the panda excited as you, as you help, help her along. And so, you can learn more about the game at this-panda.com. You can buy the game in your favorite app stores, such as the, the iTunes app store works on iPhone and iPad. The uh, Google Play works on Google phone, you know, um, Android phones and tablets. And, and uh, on the, the wonderful store itch.io, where you can get the desktop versions, either for Mac or for Windows. And, um, you know, one price, you get them both. And... Uh... You know, it's Rob's birthday, so the thing you could do is great a great gift you could get him is uh, to purchase the game. If you already have it, tell a friend about it. Tell That's a friend true. that says like, "Hey, you like the games? You like the, you like the puzzle games? Uh, maybe you know somebody. Maybe maybe your friend has a friend who likes puzzle games. Tell him to go to this dash panda dot com. And uh, if you have purchased it and you haven't given it a review, please consider doing so today because again, it's Rob's birthday. Uh, <laughs> Play that card, man. The I'm toddlers gonna... know, and <laughs> I, and they tell everyone. Toddlers know. Yeah. Some of your inner, inner toddlers <laughs> wish, wish yeah. Rob a happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> toddlers. So toddlers everywhere know. <laughs> I think they do. They have kind of a network that <laughs> is uh, beyond adult comprehension. Uh, but <laughs> supposing. You've already done that. You've already read Boulder and Fleet. Um, what else can you do? Uh, and, or maybe you're saying, like, maybe it's nice that you make stuff, but I'm really here for the podcast. Well, we make videos that are basically the self-contained versions of the podcast. 
You can download at a price if you're choosing, even zero. And there's comics workshops in there, and there's video game and UI workshops there. It's at leanintoart.com slash workshops. And if you've even done that, and you're like, what else can I do to you know, let you guys know how much I appreciate what you're doing? You could, uh, if you're watching the video on YouTube right now, you can give it a thumbs up. That helps more people find the show. Or if you're listening to the podcast uh, on a podcatcher, you can give the show a five-star review. That helps more people find the show as well. And we thank everybody who has been doing just those things. It means a lot to us. It does. Thank you very much. All right. Can we, can we wrap this one up? How do we wrap this up? What have we so, been talking about? I, um, I think we've been talking about, in a way, this implied situation of, well, you've, you're, you're hitting sort of um, maybe a peak of your capacity and things aren't flowing like you, you, you hoped. Um, maybe some commitments are being missed and or maybe some commitments are being needing to be renegotiated. However much of that is happening, it probably doesn't feel awesome. So then what, right? Like, like, and in some ways, like we've talked about the recognition of all this, but here's what I propose as the final thought is, okay, you may recognize this is happening, but like, what do you do right then? What's, what's a, what's a, and it could, this could be just our personal thing, not saying like, and now everyone must do this. That's never our deal. Right. But like, we recognized it. I feel however I feel about it. And then now what? Like, what's that next step? What is the next step? Well, I mean, we both, I'm going to say an obvious one for people who've been listening to the show for a while. Um, I think for both of us, it'd be some form of journaling and processing, right? Um, hmm. And I think our journaling styles tend to differ. Uh, mine tends to be a sort of end of Mork and Mindy episode where I try to, like, at the end of the day, capture a few thoughts about what happened, how I felt about it. Um, but sometimes it can be as simple as, like, stop... This, this like the tension meter is way up high. You're not going to do anybody any good working in the condition that you're in right now. I think you need to go for a walk. Um, today I was getting ready to go to class and I, my headspace wasn't there. And so I said, well, you know what? You're going to ride your bike to class today. You know, it's a 15 minute bike ride and that'll give you time to process. Um, so forcing myself to either a get out of the studio, move my body around, um, or B, try to capture a few thoughts to uh, hypothesize on why things went poorly. Um, and why did I make the choices that I made that day? Like, why did I choose this and not that? Um, those, are, those are some of the first actions I would take. Um, and then triangulating, triangulating with a buddy. I mean, and I have multiple buddies that I go to for different kinds of triangulation um, when it comes to that. So that's, I mean, that sounds like some really good, some really good approach. And I'm trying to think as you're answering, like, what, what do I end up doing reflectively? And, and I, I think sometimes I end up doing the whole, like, I need to find space to look at this. And that's a great time to reach out to people that you, you, like who you consider your brain trust um, tr you know, trust the collaborators, trust, you know, f find even a sounding board just so you can get it out of your head. And I mean, getting out of your head, is probably one of the biggest beneficial strategies, right? Yeah. Like the people I go to are people who are really good at listening to me. Uh, people who are patient enough to let me just barf it out and don't interrupt me with trying to fix it for me, but just like who know that I need to process this aloud. Right. Mm. Um, but a lot of times there are also people who can like listen patiently through all that stuff and then say, so are you saying this? Right. That kind of thing. I think one of the things I do too, to sort of buy capacity is sort of, um, like, a um, uh, I don't want to say like, like a triage. I mean, okay. So like the prior segment, you, you, you had the word triage and, it's almost like 
doing some triage on the commitment to create the capacity to learn and adapt and then come back to it, right? So sometimes that to me is, all right, I bust out some of my like quick self-interviewing. What's going wrong? What is, what, if, what did I expect and why? And how am I not there? What, how do I fix this? Okay, I need to do these different things. How long will it take to do those different things? And so I create like a, like a fresh estimate and a rationale, right? So I actually think I need this time and this is why. And I didn't want this to be my update for, you know, to, to the people I, com I committed to, but this is my update. And so what do you think of that? And I, I'm going to like really recommend I, you know, do this. And so baked into that estimate is the capacity to do the, um, to, to, to try to, you know, adjust course and Updating set myself estimate. up to succeed. I love that. I love the idea of updating the estimate. Hmm. So, yep. And, and that, uh, that, that capacity can be purchased through contract rene renegotiation with the, with the creative collaborator, partner, client, or it could be uh, renegotiated through, okay, this third thing that I was, I was doing, I'm not doing that for a while because I need that capacity for this thing, having looked again at how much I need to, to execute this project, right? And for personal projects in development, that client is you and yeah. you still need to do that work yep. because you can have expectations that aren't working, or that aren't fitting what you're able to deliver on and that in that in itself causes all sorts of you know, like potential friction and dissonance so renegotiating with yourself all right what do you i'm i'm, I'm dusting my hands dusting boom. your hands okay boom that's a podcast <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'm starting to take that that phrase into public use. That was like something we've like had as like a, a back channel expression for like how many years now? At least a couple of years. A couple of years, yeah. But then I was at uh, Letterpress Lab the other day, and I just wanted to test out like doing um, frames around. Well, actually, I have I think in I have the my Instagram pulled up here. I can pull up the show, everybody. Um, yeah, there it is. I'll pull that up. Uh, doing frames. Oops, can I not? Oh, it's not going to let me look at multiple pictures. Uh, well, anyway, the frame you see around there is it's actually kind of hard to typeset that with type within the frame. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, what's going to be in the frame? Oh, well, I've got a sketchbook I could print on. What can I put at the end of my sketchbook? And I was going to put something like mission accomplished. You finish your sketchbook. And I was like, nope. I'm thinking about my, my buddy Rob, what he would say. He'd say, boom, that's a sketchbook. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that makes me happy every time I see it. Uh, that's, so. that's wonderful. It's uh. Well, public use might, might, might be a handy thing. Um, it's nice to have a bookend. Nice to have that. Okay. This chapter is closed. All right. Yeah. Time to move on. And it's time to move on to the next week's show. Mm -hmm. And we will be back. We're back. We do this thing every Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Central. We broadcast live on YouTube. And then we collect the shows at patreon.com slash lean into art. And that's where you can contact us if you have any questions, thoughts, or wonderings about the shows. We would love to hear from you guys, too, as to what you'd like us to talk about next. Um, we're, we're happy to keep coming up with topic, topics week after week, but also we want to know what would be uh, of most service to you as well. You can message us there on Patreon. Mm -hmm. That'd be super handy. And, and welcome. Love to hear it. So thanks, Rob, for this discussion. Uh, oh, thank you, Jersey. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out in the chat and talking with us. And until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of LeanIntoArt.com and Jersey on, Jersey Drozd on Instagram. <laughs> and I have been uh, Rob Stenzinger of LeanIntoArt.com, and I am Rob Stenzinger on Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at LeanIntoArt.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user LeanIntoArt. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. All right, guys, I'm going to kill the stream. Thanks for hanging out with us.